Hi, Amy. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Hi, Michael. How's everything today? Everything is great. Can't complain. It's nice, to nice to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So um, I guess to get started off, I mean, what inspired you to get into the college recruiting coaching space? Um, you know, I worked for um, 20 plus years with college student athletes, kind of sitting on the other side of the desk, um, looking at high school student athletes who were recruits who wanted to be on my team. And I just um, saw an opportunity to um, jump in and kind of help these uh, student athletes um, in terms of directing their search, making sure they understood um, some key principles before they even wound up in my office talking to me, um, but also really understood their place or their potential place in college sports, because I think that's you know, the big question on their mind is, how do I really fit in? How could I fit in? Where can I play? Who wants me? All of this stuff. And it's so anxiety provoking. So I really saw an opportunity to be able to jump in and help out on the front end before they got to that seat sitting across from me, sweating, um, you know, nervous about what I would say. Um, you know, just um, there's a great opportunity there. So. Um, that's, that's really what kind of launched the idea for Bryant college coaching. Okay. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that, that certainly speaks to me and I've talked about the process in this space in different forms as well about recruiting and things. So uh, I'm curious when you were just purely a coach, right? Like when you were on the other uh -huh. side doing the recruiting, like what yep. were some of the biggest issues you identify or some of the biggest challenges you had in terms of, um, attracting or sort of communicating with potential uh, recruits? Well, in terms of attracting recruits, where I was um, at Emory University, um, I honestly had a very easy time with recruiting because Emory kind of speaks for itself and, and attracted mm -hmm. the recruits for me. So the bigger issue was um, getting recruits to understand the level of our team and how strong it is. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a lot of um, prospective student athletes come through that really um, never had a chance to play for me, for lack of a better word, you know, lack of a better explanation there. And so I think that that, was really a challenge for me is getting the messaging out that our program is a high caliber program. And yes, we're academically selective. Um, yes, we're division three and we don't have athletic scholarships, but just because we don't have athletic scholarships doesn't mean we don't recruit and produce quality um, tennis. So, um, so that I think was, was a huge uh, challenge as a coach. Um, now, after some time, once, you know, I, I was there for a long time. So at maybe, you know, three to five years in, I think the word started to get out in the tennis community of how serious the program we were, what the expectations were of the program um, in terms of intensity, in terms of training schedule, in terms of student athlete balance. And I say that um, in quotes. But, um, you know, the expectations are high. It's, at, mm -hmm. you know, Emory, where I was coaching, was a very high academic school. So there's incredible expectations on these student athletes to perform academically in the classroom. But there's also incredible expectations on them to perform as athletes for me. So um, anyways, just making, getting that reputation out there really helped me as a coach in the recruiting process. And certainly that happened, you know, over time. And I think now the word, you know, Emory tennis, even with me gone is kind of synonymous with, okay, that's a high level, high caliber program that, you know, I'm a, I'm a quality player and a great student. This is where I should be looking, but yeah. um, being able to come in and help 
on that side of things with the student athletes that are high school student athletes and looking at colleges and being able to say, look, there are different types of division three non-athletic scholarship programs in all sports. And it doesn't matter whether or not the program is, um, is a division three program. What matters is what the expectations of the coach are for you as a student athlete. So I'm able to come in now and kind of explain that based on my um, familiarity with a number of programs across the country, a number of sports across the country, Mm -hmm. and I'm able to kind of steer them in the right direction from the beginning. So they don't wind up veering off course. Yeah. So how how much of it, how much of it do you think is just sort of a lack of awareness or understanding on the side of the family and the student athlete about what they value the most, right? So one of the things that comes up a lot in this space where I talk to people on the podcast, but just in general is the idea of finding the fit that works for you, right? Not just athletically, but academically, geographically, whatever is important to you. Like how much of do you think that how much of that do you think is the issue meaning that people think they want something but they don't really know what they want exactly well they don't understand (laughs) what it entails um and i think also there are so many external influences um that students and their families are hearing and it's kind of um creating all this noise for them so we have obviously the u.s news and world report rankings so for Mm -hmm. high academic kids you know their thought is i have to go to one of the top 50 schools in the country or i should be going let's use shoulds i should be going to the one of the top 50 schools in the country right and so that's the only places that they'll look whereas there's four thousand colleges in the country and there's plenty of great places that Mm -hmm. can really transform all students' lives um, outside of the top 50 that we read about. So we have that influence and that pressure that they're experiencing. And then also you have the the pressure of, I've been playing the sport my whole life. I should be getting a scholarship. You know, again, we get to the shoulds and you know all about Mm -hmm. the shoulds. Um, and how damaging they can be to to a young person's psyche in this whole process. So, um, and in any process, but um, yeah, so there's that idea that they should be getting a scholarship and the scholarship programs are the best programs um, for me. Uh, so yeah, that's that's certainly something that I have to then go about kind of reversing those, those um those societal pressures and that, you know, expectation. I have to really just kind of break through and get down mm-hmm. to the, what is best for you and who are you and what are, what do you value? What are your desires and motivators and what are your goals mm-hmm. and, and right. how can we really achieve that? Can you achieve that at a top 50 school or can you achieve that at um, number 67 where you're going to be playing all the time? And you're going to get a lot of attention from a coach because they're really interested in having you on that program. Or, you know, are you going to get that at a program where you're sitting on the bench and might not play for four years? Or are you going to get what you're after? Um, again, playing somewhere where you're really wanted. So um, just breaking down um, all of the, yeah. all of the shoulds, I think is essential. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's, there's a couple of things I want to follow up with because one, the shoulds is definitely an epidemic. Uh, and it's one of my, it's one of my personally, one of my least favorite words in the English language, but as it relates to student athletes, I think they do put a lot of pressure on themselves or they mismanage expectations about what is possible or even what they're, what they're prepared to do to get to those places, right? Like you may be capable of playing somewhere, but are you prepared to put in the work and effort and do the things that are necessary? Right. And those are two totally different things, but I guess when when you were talking, I was thinking about now in the world that we live in, the idea that athletes can transfer more easily and you've got other issues out there like NIL that influence decision-making. Do you see that as being an issue in your work? Yeah. So 
Uh, well, first of all, let me get back to the being prepared because I think that, you know, I definitely missed mm-hmm. that in your last question, but I think that's essential. And one of the things I'm working on right now is creating a student athlete readiness kind of questionnaire that I can go through with my student athletes. Like, again, are you prepared to do the work? And let me explain mm-hmm. to you what the work is at a, at a program yeah. that is vying for a championship, no matter what the level is, no matter what division, no matter NCAA, NAI, JUCO, let me explain to you what this is going to entail for competitive program. We're talking five to six hours a week of training or five to six days a week of training, three to four hours a day, you know, minimum plus your schoolwork on top of that. And let me, let's get even more into the nitty gritty Mm -hmm. there. Let's talk about what that training looks like, because whatever you were doing potentially at your, you know, private coach's office or, or, office, I use as term to, to express, you know, the field, the court, the, the space, right. um, whatever you were doing with your private coach before, and this is a whole new ball game. The expectations are different. You can't cut the line in sprints anymore. You can't decide, ah, I'm not going to practice today because, you know, I'm not feeling like it. You know, you were paying for, for that kind of support before in most cases. Um, and so coaches, you know, what can, what can they say that they, they're being paid by you? you? You're not paying the coach anymore, no, no matter what, right. what, what, what college you're playing for, you know? So um, just understanding that kind of what the commitment truly entails is essential. But um, to get back to like your, your other question about the transfer portal portal and NIL, it is mm-hmm. a different ball game out there. Um, it's a different ball game for recruits because what coaches are doing, I work with a lot of men's soccer players, so I'll use them as an example. Um, in men's soccer, what I'm seeing a lot of is um, coaches going to the transfer portal before they even bother looking at mm-hmm. graduating high school boys soccer players. Mm-hmm. Um, because, w- I mean, why wouldn't they? You have you have tried and tested and true um, men who have played at least one year somewhere else. They understand that commitment that we were just talking about. They understand they are prepared for it because they've already done it. There's no question mark in a coach's mind and the recruiting, um, landscape on whether or not this kid can handle what they're about to, to throw at them. Now, before the transfer portal, you know, transferring was a lot more difficult. So the kids that transferred, there was always this red flag kind of that would go up in my mind as a coach, like, why why are they transferring? What's wrong with this kid? Or what, you know, or, or are they not coachable? Are they, you know, so there are all sorts of red flags that would go up now with the, the ease of the transfer portal. I mean, kids are just going in because you know what, I want to play at a higher level and I can, because I have a year of experience under my belt and now I'll get the attention of the coach I couldn't get before. So it, it really changes um, what schools these kids need to look at as seniors in high school. Um, you also asked about NIL, and I'll, I'll say this about NIL. Um, you know, that's it's an evolving situation every day. It's, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it was new a year ago, and, and every day we, we hear more and more, you know, things that, that, people are coming up with ways to make money and um, ways that colleges are, or their alumni bases are ensuring that they get the best um, athletes to get in with most of the student athletes that I work with. NIL isn't like a game changer for them. Um, It is something that I talk to them about as being a potential source of revenue for them as they consider their college costs, because as mm-hmm. we know, there are only you know six sports that are headcount sports, which means they have they offer full scholarships to their entire roster, and the rest of the sports that are out there are all equivalency sports, which means coaches get creative um, in terms of how they are divvying out that money to their teams, and, and if they're good students, they can stack on some academic money as well. Mm-hmm. But either way, I mean, kids are still trying to scrounge to cover that full cost. So I look at NIL as here's an opportunity yeah. for you. If you're a good, if you're, if you love the hustle, you want to get out there and, and forge some partnerships with some local businesses, you could get out there and um, potentially, you know, uh, bridge the gap between um, the total cost of college and what you're getting for college. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And that's, I think that's, that's a, across all divisions. I'll, I'll say that that's across all divisions, yeah. all, all, you know, the whole thing. For sure. Right. And, and I, and I think the way you, you describe that is, is, is probably the best description I've heard of it. Right. Because it's, it's, it is a practical consideration, right? Like if you can generate a source of revenue to offset the cost of going to a place like Emory, for example, where you're not getting an athletic scholarship, the cost is, is really going to be very high. Yeah. Maybe you get some academic money, but you still have to come up with quite a bit. Like, why wouldn't you think of that as a factor? Now, I think the trick is, and you know this better than I do, and you could probably speak to it is, is making sure that the people who are deciding, like the families are not distorting mm-hmm. the weight or the value of that, right? It's a factor, but in four years, it's probably going to be over. And do you want to have made a decision based on, I got $7,500 in NIL money every year versus 5,000 and then go, well, I made an extra 2,500, but now the four years that I spent there, I wasn't happy or it didn't lead me to where I wanted to go. Right. So like being able to help them assess the trade-offs, if you will. Yeah. And understanding the ROI, the return on their investment Mm -hmm. is really essential too. And that was, you know, one of my chief like recruiting strategies with families was to really talk about the ROI because at a school that didn't offer athletic scholarships and is one of the more expensive schools in the country, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there has to be a value associated with going there in terms of what are you going to get in your future? And I really felt like there was at Emory. And, um, so I would definitely use that, that terminology, um, a lot. Yeah. So, so I'm, I guess I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, obviously the work is with the student athlete, right. In terms of identifying what they want, what they need, kind of getting them focused on what they're prepared to do. How much of your work involves the student athlete versus the family? Meaning like how much of it is a sort of a tag team or is it more, Hey, let me focus on the young, the student athlete because they're almost an adult and this is their experience. Yeah, it's a really good question and very valid. Um, so, and, and it is, my work now is very different than what it was when I was a coach, because when yeah. I was a coach, I really tried to put up a wall between myself and the parents and just say, you know what, your kids are adults. I'm working directly with them. Mm-hmm. And I know it's different for you because that's not how it was in juniors, but you know, this is the way that it's going to be over the four years because that's how mm-hmm. I'm going to build trust in my relationship with your, with your daughter. Mm-hmm. Now, because I'm working with younger student athletes and you know, the client is certainly the parent for me, the customer, I'm sorry, the customer is certainly the parent for me. The client is certainly the student. Well said. Um, so, so my customers, I have to check in with absolutely. And, and they're the ones um, that are, are, you know, they're the ones that decided to hire me. They're the ones that want to see the best for their child. Mm-hmm. I look at it like a triangular relationship where, you know, I will communicate with the student athlete. I will communicate with the parent. Um, sometimes the parent and the student athlete aren't communicating because oh of goodness. the age. Right. And, um, so, so I kind of help to, um, bridge uh, that gap with, with the family dynamics that, that sometimes happen at this age, but, um, I really love it. Um, I'm a parent of teenagers as well. So, <laughs> so I, I definitely feel like I'm, I'm comfortable in that space and, and I can speak from personal experience as well. But, um, but I really love, I mean, my favorite thing about coaching for 23 years and my favorite thing now in my business is working directly with the student athlete and, and now preparing them for college, working directly with them so that when they get there, they can be independent and, and thrive. Yeah. So uh, something, I mean, what you said there, I mean, it, 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 it definitely rung a bell with me because it's the same, very, very similar in my work in the sense that like, the customer to your point is the parent they're paying the bill, right. Or they're investing in this, but the student athlete is the one who's really being affected. And you use the word like sort of, you know, try, you know, it's like a triangle, what we would call in sports psychology, triangulation, right. Communicating amongst the multiple parties to make sure everybody's on the same page. And it's exactly what I see. Sometimes I get a kid who's telling me one thing and a parent who's telling me another thing and they're not communicating. And now I got two different stories and it's like, well, what do I do with this? I have to find a way to bridge the gap. How Mm -hmm. much do you find like 
mom and dad are saying this is really important junior or you know mary or or johnny is saying this is really important and it's different and you have to try to like be the bridge or is it consistent most of the time and it's just exceptions where they're not communicating about what's important well i have to say that i've been really fortunate um in the families that i've had the privilege of working with in that while the parents might have had an idea of what they wanted for their child at the end of the day they are very comfortable letting go a little bit and letting Mm -hmm. their child drive the process and i say that to them as well you know in my um, initial meetings with them and through all my materials like at some point you're gonna have to you know let go a little bit um Mm -hmm. and so they the these families have been fantastic that i've worked with so far in just letting them really drive the process i mean they'll pipe in and try to influence when they can as they should um but for the most part, they're, you know, if, if they are totally going in separate directions, eventually they'll yield. Okay. Yeah. And that's also similar to my experience. I, I agree with that. Especially I think people self-select, meaning like when they come to you, they're usually, they're, use the word, I don't this could come out the wrong way, but their egos aren't as big as my, someone else's might be. Meaning if they're coming to you for help, right. they know they need help versus like- there you go right? Like they're, they're already like self-selecting into the idea that like, I can't do this alone. Like, Hey, I trust you to do this to help me. And so like, you don't get that, um, that conflict that you might get with somebody who, who doesn't want to do it. So, um, so I, I guess, and I, I have a lot of questions, but where do you start? Meaning like when, when someone, a new client comes into the process and you're trying to get them to understand it or get them to focus or really narrow down sort of where they want to be or, or get them to maybe choose their preferences. Like, where do you start with them? Um, academics. I always try to start my process academically and, um, and that really, I mean, at the end of the day, they're going to college. They're, they're going to, probably not be a professional athlete. We know Mm -hmm. what the stats are on that. So Mm -hmm. the, it's essential for them to go to a place where they can, you know, find a career and, and part of, part of finding that path has a lot to do with the symbiotic relationship between their athletics and their academics. Mm -hmm. But we're going to start with academics. We're going to talk about what we want to study. We're going to talk about our, you know, grades and and how we do in school, how we learn best, all of these good things. We're going to Mm -hmm. talk about the rigor of the curriculum they're comfortable with so that I can kind of point out some schools where I feel like, okay, you will, you know, thrive in this environment because this is what you're comfortable with. And then we take it from there and look at based on that, here are some schools where I believe you can play as well. Yeah. Um, so that's where you got to start in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, listen, I, I, I certainly am not an expert in, in, in the recruiting process and admissions and, 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 and that's your business. But what I have seen with some of my, my student athlete clients is, is that absolutely right. If you can't get into the school, you can't play there, right? Like that's, that's the first consideration and I've had student athletes who've wanted to play in certain places and they can't, they can't pass the academic standards. And so it's, it's a non-starter, right? So like right. you got to pick the schools you can get into and then say, Hey, all right, now I want to go here. Let's see how we can get in and, you know, either get a spot or preferred walk on or if you're division one, or just to say, Hey, I have a chance to come in and play, you know, at a right. division three. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And it doesn't even, it, it, the, the crazy thing is with that too, it doesn't even matter if the student will be successful at the school because there are plenty of schools where I feel like this student would be very successful. What really matters is can they get in? <laughs> and right. so, and that and, and getting in is, 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 is really a result of for an athlete's situation uh, how much support the coach has with the admissions office. And so yeah, I've heard that's that too. where, <laughs> yep. That's where I really try to help, you know, based on my knowledge of past, um, uh, past acceptances and, you know, trends and everything else. And my knowledge of admissions offices, um, 
it, that's where I try to like steer them to places where I know they'll be able to get in, but mm-hmm. being successful, I mean, you know, there's, there's a, a lot to be said for, you know, students can be successful almost anywhere. It's not really, yeah. that's not really the key factor. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to get in the weeds here. Cause this is also something I've heard. I was, I was just talking to, and I wish I could recall the, the, the specifics of it, but I was talking to a, a college coach in a, a, like a non sort of not basketball or football. And I asked them about the admissions process and how much, you know, how much influence they have over it. And they basically said like football always gets first like dibs and admissions right uh-huh. in this place that, that mm-hmm. he was at. I think it may have been division one. Um, so how much from your experience, like how much does the sport itself have to do with the ability of the coach to get, to have that influence or is it more just tenure or seniority or just relationships in terms of like pulling and pushing those buttons to get admissions to maybe make an exception for a kid who doesn't exactly have academics that are needed, but they're athletically, they're somebody the coach really wants. Yeah. I mean, there are priorities that are, you know, that every school has where, and and those could stem from the board of trustees. Those could stem from the admissions officers. I, I mean, mostly it's, it's above admissions, but, um, that could stem from the athletic department itself. Mm-hmm. And so unfortunately, these priorities aren't transparent um, and they're certainly not published anywhere. Right. Um, but, you know, I've seen it run the gamut in that I've seen, you know, I've seen and I'm not talking about personal experience per se. So please don't think because, you know, I was at Emory that I'm speaking about Emory, but I have heard yeah. about I will say this. Um, athletic directors uh, not liking a specific coach. So when they put together the, uh, the entire department's list for, um, for athletics, you know, then they might put that coach's kid, their top recruit below a few other sports. I mean, certainly that happens because maybe there's an ulterior motive. This is the priority I'm talking. They want want to get rid of a coach. Well, this is the way to do it. Recruiting is the lifeblood of any coach. So that, that certainly does happen. I mean, I was grateful. You mentioned football. I mean, I was grateful to be at a non-football school Mm -hmm. um, because I did see a lot of resources go the way of um, the other sports. And, you know, we were very fortunate where I was, but yes, I've heard that before too, that football gets first pick. Um, You know, I think every school is a little bit different again sure. and, and, and all the priorities are different. So, and there's no way for any one person to really know which <laughs> right. way. I mean, unless you have a direct line to every admissions Dean in the country, that's 4,000, you know, plus um, there's no way for any one person to know that you can only kind of look at trends and talk to people and hearsay and try to put it all together in your head. And, and that's, you know, the best advice you can give kids. Yeah. So, so I, I think that's a good segue to the next question I wanted to ask you before you had talked about your own experience as a coach and building the trust with the student athlete in that recruiting process, bringing them in the door. Right. And so I'm thinking now from wearing your hat as a sort of a coach on externally trying to help student athletes, how much are you coaching them on how to approach the questions to ask, understanding coaching staff philosophy, because I think that's a big one because it's mm-hmm. a sell, it's a sales process, right? Like coach A tells Johnny or Mary one thing in the recruiting process, like I want to get this kid in the door. Now the kid gets in the door. Now they see something completely different because they didn't ask the right questions to understand yeah. like what they were really like walking into. So how much of that do you do to have them ask the good questions to understand like really what this program's all about before they get there? Yeah, that's a huge part of what I do. I mean, that's the core piece of what I do. Um, I think it's actually, it's really important actually to start first with with getting these student athletes to understand who they are first, Mm -hmm. what are their strengths first, 
then being able to relate those strengths to the philosophy of the coach that they're communicating with, to the team mm -hmm. culture that they are witnessing when they go on these visits and being able to say, you know what, I don't think my strengths are necessarily going to fit in with this team culture or this team coach. Um, so, um, and yes, absolutely. I talk them through almost everything. I mean, from what I call understanding coach speak, mm -hmm. um, you know, when a, when a coach says to you, yeah, I, I, um, I, you're on my list, you know, we've got you on our radar. Thanks for being in touch to when a coach actually says, um, we want you on our team. I have a spot for you you know, and, and you're, you're going to be my next number one or my, you know, you're going to play center mid or, you know, whatever it is, you're going to be my starter starter as a freshman, like understanding what all of these things mean. They don't always mean what you hope they mean, you know, <laughs> hope is not a strategy here, guys. Um, so we need, we need definite, we need direct information. And I definitely mm -hmm. coach them to, to be able to ask those questions, to get that information. That, that's, that's a really interesting point. Cause I have heard that from some of my clients, like just explaining to me, cause I'm learning about the process as well. Um, where they say like, listen, we have a spot for you, but they also put a time, like a time element on it to yeah. say like, Hey, if you don't tell me soon or by this date, then number two is going to get the spot. Because like, I can't wait. And so it becomes a, like what you're describing, I think is it really is a sales process, right? A negotiation and a sales process of, Hey, I'm selling my value proposition. I'm trying to match that up mm -hmm. with the school's value proposition. Is it a fit? And now you, if, even if there's a fit there, there's still a negotiation that has to happen with the school and the student athlete to say like, a, do I want to wait and see if there's a better offer coming along? Do I right. take it? Do I get pressured into it? Like all this stuff, it's like, this is like really important, like life skill building. And I think for families to try to do that on their own, it's a real challenge, right? If you don't have somebody who really understands that process, because you're like, you're, you're at a disadvantage, I would think, if you don't have somebody who knows the recruiting process on your side to help you sort of weed through all of that. Is that, I mean, I know it's a little self-serving, but is it, is it fair? <laughs> Absolutely fair. Um, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm that muse that's just kind of sitting on your shoulder saying, yes, that's, that's what you want to hear or no, that's not a good, <laughs> you don't want to <laughs> hear that. Um, you know, and it's like, it's like going into a used car sales lot. You know, I liken it to that sometimes where you have the pressure of, well, is that car really going to not be there if I come back tomorrow and think about it overnight, you know, and, mm -hmm. and here I am in the back of your ear, you can leave, you can walk away. It's still going to be there tomorrow. I promise you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, recruiting is sales. Let's, let's call 100%. it what it is. Yep. And um, these, these families, I, I think, really benefit from having somebody that can help them through understand that that what's really being said to you understand um what it means if you if you say i need some more time if you push back like what what really what are the repercussions what are the potential repercussions you know let's walk let's walk through mm -hmm. that Let's talk about what the other options are. Let's talk about the timing of all of this, you know? And so one thing that I do with my student athletes is they have direct access to me. Um, they can message me whenever they want, um, whatever they need. And I usually get back pretty quickly. Um, and, and that really helps to reduce that anxiety that mm -hmm. comes from this process. It's yeah. a huge decision. It's these kids are making a decision that is more expensive than a car. So, um, you know, <laughs> yes. I, yeah. So, um, and, 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 and I think, you know, one, and, and listen, I think it's great that you do that. Um, I do that too. I think I'm a big believer in granting them the agency, right? It, it, especially, I mean, imagine certainly if the parents have to be on board with that, right? But assuming they are, right? That ability for them to navigate and communicate with you directly is really important. And it, it actually, it lines up with what everything I've heard and, and you've done this from the other side that I've heard from college coaches, which is like, I want the kid who one takes ownership of the recruiting process. I don't have to deal with mom and dad Two, Like I want the kid who comes to my program and says, I really want to be in your program, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, this, this person is putting themselves 
out on a limb to say, I want to play at your program, which tells me what they're motivated to come in and do the work that's necessary to be at a program like that. In fact, my, actually she was my, she's my cousin, but much younger and she's played soccer in the ACC. And I had her on the podcast eons ago. And she was telling me the story about how she wanted to go to play in the ACC. She knew that. And she wanted to play at this one particular school, which is Louisville, because she's there now and we just talked about it. And she tells me, like, I followed up with the coach over and over and over and over. And eventually I caught him on the right day and he said, yeah, we're going to offer you, right? Whereas I think the vast majority of kids don't want to, they don't think that that's the right approach. But like, you got to know that if, you know, you're going to a place like that, any school, frankly, nowadays, because I feel like every kid plays college sports now but like the list of recruits has got to be like about this high if you know if you're watching the video it's like a stack the only way to get yourself to the top of the pile is to follow up and stay relevant and stay asking the question of like what can i do where are we in the process like and i think a lot of kids just think of recruiting as like this selection process like a beauty contest like oh they're just going to come find me and that is not mm -hmm. it at all as far as i can tell is that fair yeah Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that it, you know, I'd say, I say to my student athletes all the time, it costs nothing to send an email it costs zero. So, you know, let's, let's send, let's be persistent. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I think a lot of these kids are so insecure about yep. their, their potential place in, in college athletics that they are like, eh, if the coach didn't respond to me one time, that just means they're not interested in me because I'm not good enough. And that's where I kind of come in as, you know, as being a coach and being able to, to really motivate student athletes to go after something. And, you know, and I just tell them, look, this, that is not the reality of the situation that is, you know, illogical for you to be saying to yourself. And so we, we talk a lot about that. And, um, and then I just encourage them to resend the email it takes more than one time because the, like you said, the, these coaches, their inboxes are full. Oh I mean, I would, there were days when I would get 50 emails a day. There's no way to keep up with that. So, you know, it's just a matter of being persistent. I liken the whole process and you kind of hinted at this before to a, your, their first job interview. If you want a job, you got to go after it. Mm -hmm. And it takes more than just sending in your resume. I'm sorry, but sending in your resume doesn't work. It's never worked. What works is, the networking that you've set up to get somebody to call whoever's reading the resume and say, I want you to take that person's resume out of the pile and make sure it makes it into the next one. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of work that, that we're doing. Um, and in order to do that, we do use a private coach. We will use a private coach to call if it's an appropriately match school athletically we'll you know we'll we'll try whatever we need to try to get sure. in the door um just like you would try it if it was a job interview yeah and, and, and i think i mean i think that just was so important for the development like the life the life skill development the, the personal development of a young person because that's not something i learned until i was in my 20s Right. Like, right. so if you have somebody guiding you through that process of saying like, Hey, it's not personal. You need to understand all the roles and responsibilities of a coach, including compliance. They're dealing with recruiting. They're on the road. They're, they're dealing with internal stuff. They're, they're, they're coaching, right. They're traveling. Like if they don't respond to your, e Oh, and by the way, they've got 50 emails. Like it's not personal if you understand all that and you're able to put yourself in that coach's shoes a little bit and you say, okay, like I'm just going to follow up with the email, the likelihood or the great, it's going to be more likely the next time they respond because now I got this second email from this person. It's in my brain. Right. And like, that's just a skill that's great for them to learn whether or not they get selected by that coach or recruited in, in some instances almost doesn't matter because they're probably going to end up somewhere and have a good experience or have, they're going to play. But it's that the, the virtue of learning that life skill and going through the process of like challenging themselves emotionally to take the risk, like that's, that's really valuable. Absolutely. And, and, and it's not, you know, we talk about risks. I mean, I have to, I have to break that word down for them. I'm like this, what, 
what level risk is this? Is this high mm -hmm. risk? Is this mid risk? Is this low risk? Like, let's really, let's, let's really take a look at this because then you got to look at the potential rewards also. So, yeah. um, so we'll talk through all of those things um, when we're, when we're going through the process and trying to get on a coach's radar, but um, yeah, life lessons. There's a lot that's of life a great lessons point. through the process. But that's a really good point because the question I would ask a kid in my, in my own work is like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Absolutely. And yeah. I think a lot of times it gets so distorted in their minds that like, oh, if I send another email, I'm going to piss this coach off and they're going to take me off the list. No, <laughs> they're probably going to like it, first of all, because right. they're going to be like, hey, this kid really wants to be here. Secondly, like you're reminding them, hey, okay, like they want to, you know, th this is helping me to follow up. It's, it's not actually a detriment, but they're not at a point in their lives where they understand that and they go to the worst possible outcome, which is like, oh, they, they're not going to like me. Right. That's not the right. way it works. Well, that's distorted thinking and it's, yeah. and it's finest, right? So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I know every sport's a little bit different, at least based upon what I've learned over the last few years in terms of recruiting. But when do you suggest people start to get thinking about the recruiting process? It's a little different if you're a female athlete or a male athlete. Honestly. Okay. I've found that female or, or, or women's sports tend to trend a little bit earlier, you know, perhaps because women do develop a little bit earlier than, or girls develop earlier than boys. Mm -hmm. So I have seen that, um, you know, girls are committing a little earlier than boys and the process moves faster. And, you know, I don't know, we could, we could get into um, the skill set of female coaches versus the skill sets of male coaches. We could certainly stereotype all of that as well. <laughs> but I've seen female coaches being very organized and, you know, some male coach, I, I you know, again, I don't want to stereotype. There are definitely some male coaches out there that are great and organized with the recruiting also, but, but some, are not. Mm -hmm. Um, and as there are some in the women's side, there <laughs> as well, I will, I will be, I will be fair, but, um, I, I've seen that the, the women's coaches do seem to get after it a little bit earlier. So whatever the rationale is, I would say that girls really should be thinking about things as early as their freshman year. They should at least start going through some of the, um, self-awareness work that I do at the very least. Mm -hmm. And, um, they should be talking uh, well both sexes should be talking about their curriculum for college based on what their goals might be as early as their freshman year because whatever curriculum they take is certainly going to impact the rigor that they're able to take along the way which would impact mm -hmm. what schools will be available to them or the selectivity of right. the schools so so boys and girls both should be thinking about that freshman year <laughs> The other thing they both should be thinking about is how to get into the best league possible um, by their sophomore year at the latest. And when I say league, that's mostly, you know, for team sports, but they want to be competing. I'll, I'll say it a different way. They want to be competing at the highest level possible for them because that's where the best exposure comes from with college coaches. Um, mm. So that's an important thing to understand as a freshman, but otherwise, um, in terms of reaching out to coaches, you know, um, girls can start doing that freshman year, sophomore year, um, boys can start doing that sophomore year, junior year. Now there are recruiting rules that you're probably aware of where sport coaches can't necessarily, yeah, sport by sport, division by division. Um, and also organization by organization, because, you know, there's not NCAA isn't the only game out there. There's yeah. also the NAIA. There's also NJCA. Um, there's um, California Community College Association. Like there's there's other games in town, yep. which are definitely getting a lot more attention with that transfer portal open. But um, the the it's important to understand that coaches can't necessarily get back to you until a certain date right. in some of those divisions and organizations, but you, they are receiving your emails, your messaging. Um, they can talk to your private coaches. So there's some loopholes there. Um, so it's important to get on your radar. Um, I would say about that time, depending yeah. on so, girls. Or yeah. Boys. And I'm, listen, it goes really fast. I'm a parent of a freshman boy. And we've actually, I've started to like plant the seeds in his head. Like if you want to be a player 
in college, like you need to start thinking about this stuff. Um, but I'm certainly not going to do it for him. So like, if yeah. he's not motivated, that's fine. But, but, but the planting the seeds, right? Like, and then you've got, to your point, you've got understanding to like, even at a high level, the compliance calendar, right? Meaning what are the dark periods? What are the live periods? Like, why isn't someone responding? Oh, cause they can't. Right. Right. But you, but you also got the rules, right? Every sport has different rules. We can only offer, you know, past a certain time, right? Like for families to understand that is important, right? Or to have somebody who helps them to understand yes. that through an, through an advisor. The other question I was not planning to ask, but I really do want to ask when, now that yeah. you said it is, how much more um, frequent or how big of an issue now is the junior college route? And is it a hard sell to people because of this, maybe a stigma about going JUCO just in general? I want to go to a four-year school versus a two-year school. I really want to talk about that because I think it's a great route for a lot of kids, but I don't think a lot of kids and families want that. Can you kind of just talk about your experiences with that? Yeah, my the families that I've worked with have not been as open to the junior college community college route. Unfortunately, um, I've I have had conversations with a couple parents. It's like mm, that's you know intriguing, and, and that's the way it should be. I think it should be intriguing for every family. Um, junior college community college is not right for every kid. Um, mm -hmm. That's for sure, but it can be a great option for some. And so it's becoming more and more a part of the discussion, um, depending on, again, the academics of the student athlete first and foremost. Yeah. I, I also would imagine that, that finances play a role in those conversations as well about junior college Absolutely. because there's a huge difference in most cases. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great point. And I probably should have mentioned that, but, um, yeah, the, you, you, the price difference is so incredibly vast. Um, it is certainly worth exploring for families in need. And then the other thing that um, is is worth exploring for, and and I shouldn't even say families in need. I mean, any family needs to be cost conscious, right? I mean, yeah. college is expensive. Um, but the other thing that you know is important to do is to understand what kind of need is a, or what kind of financial aid is available to you based on your need. Um, so you know there is federal student aid. Mm -hmm. There is um, there there are grants offered by many institutions, um, and then also understanding the gap between what you might be uh, uh might be able to get in versus what the school is able to give you right, right so that's an important factor as well but yeah the finances are our discussion for a lot of my families and it, and it certainly can drive the process the other thing that i'll say is um for those families who who are very concerned most of the families are concerned about the cost of college and they think that the only place that they are going to be able to go is Division One or Division Two because of the athletic scholarships. I mean, this gets back to the JUCO and community college thing. I mean, it's so much less expensive. But the other option is many D3s that don't have athletic scholarships. Actually, 75 to 80 percent of students in D3 receive some form of merit aid. Mm -hmm. And so that's really important. No, you could get more at a D3 school than you could at any D1 or D2 school, depending on the sport. So, yeah. And so do you think that there, like, there's almost a mentality of every dollar is not created equal, meaning like, I'd rather say I got athletic scholarship money because of prestige versus just getting, you know, some sort of merit-based academic support, even though the dollars are the dollars, people want to say they got a scholarship. Do you think that that's a consideration? I do. I think that's very similar to the prestige factor that kind of drives the the college search as well. I think being able to say to to friends and family, uh, "Oh, my kid got an you know an athletic scholarship." Everyone wants to use the word "full ride," but that's just such a misnomer. <laughs> I won't even. Yeah, it's such a misnomer. It's football, but, right? But, football and basketball, basically. Yeah. Well, there's six sports that have. That's it. So, um, anyways. Uh, Although, again, you know, you could really technically, I guess you could say you got a full ride at a non-headcount sport if you did have the academic aid that kind of added on. But in any case, um, I, you know, I, I think it's just essential to really understand what the options are, what and, and 
And they all at the end of the day, I mean, it's a dollar amount at the end. It's the same dollar amount. Does it really matter how you get there? If your kid's happy and they're going to have a, a, a very, you know, full, holistic kind of experience that, mm-hmm. that matches what they need and what they want and all of that, does it really, ma- do you have to say they got a full ride or do you have to say they got an athletic club or do you have to say you're at a top 50 school? Like, let's, let's be real. Yeah. Well, as we sort of wrap up here and I really have enjoyed talking to you because I, I always learn something from my guests and, and I, I, the space that you're in, I think is really, really important in terms of being able to offer families the resources that, that are, that they need to really make good informed choices that are going to really affect lifetimes, not just for their kids, but potentially for them, you know, it's it's a generational type of investment to put your kids through college, right? Like if, if you're doing it blindly, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, so I'm going to ask a two part question to sort of wrap up here with you. One is if you had to give one piece of advice to the student athlete, what would it be? And if you had to give one piece of advice to parents, what would it be? Um, to the student athlete, I would say to be persistent in the process, to really, you know, cast a broad or cast a wide net with the list of schools that they have, mm-hmm. um, but to, to be really persistent in um, attracting the attention of coaches as of those realistic options. Um, and then to parents, um, it would probably be kind of what we talked about before. And that is, uh, well, I always say to parents, you should be the chauffeur, you should be the chef, you should be the cheerleader. And, you know, you got to know your budget too, you know, but, um, but, but that's, that's it outside of those four areas, you know, just step back and let your, let your child take control of the process. Let them take the lead. It's really good advice. Amy, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I really appreciate your insights and I'm looking forward to sharing it with, uh, with all the listeners. So thank you so much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure.